Elizabeth of Austria was born on July 5, 1554 as the daughter of Maximilian II, Holy Roman Emperor, and Maria of Spain. Raised in the opulent courts of Vienna, she was immersed in a world of privilege, grandeur, and rigid political expectations. The Habsburg dynasty, to which she belonged, was one of the most influential families in Europe, with ties to almost every major kingdom. Elizabeth was groomed from an early age for a life of royal duty, instilled with the values of loyalty to the Catholic Church and obedience to political authority. Her childhood in Vienna was a mixture of luxurious splendor and stifling isolation. Though she had siblings, including the future emperors, she led a sheltered life, rarely venturing beyond the boundaries of the court. In her teenage years, the search for a suitable political marriage began in earnest. With her flawless pale skin, long blonde hair, and perfect physique, she was considered one of the great beauties of the era. She was also regarded as demure, pious, and warm-hearted while, at the same time, naive and intensely innocent because of her sheltered upbringing. Still, she was said to be as intellectually talented and charming as her father, the Holy Roman Emperor. In 1570, at the tender age of 16, she was betrothed to King Charles IX of France, a man tormented by the heavy burdens of kingship and familial pressures. Her marriage, which took place on October 22nd of the same year, was as much a sacrifice for her as it was a political necessity for the Habsburg and Valois dynasties. France at the time was on the precipice of civil war. The Protestant Reformation had set Europe ablaze and France was engulfed in a bitter conflict between Catholics and French Protestants, known as Huguenots. While the marriage was seen as a means to strengthen Catholic ties, Elizabeth was thrust into an environment rife with religious strife and political manipulation. Despite the political motivations behind their marriage, Elizabeth's early days as queen were marked by a sense of quiet hope. She was young, beautiful, and determined to fulfill her royal duties. However, she quickly realized that her husband, King Charles IX, was not only a weak and troubled ruler but a man haunted by deep psychological turmoil. The pressures of the crown weighed heavily on Charles, who had been thrust into power at the age of 10, following the untimely death of his elder brother, King Francis II. His mother, the formidable Catherine de' Medici, acted as regent and wielded much of the real power behind the throne. The young queen, drawing upon a deep inner strength and an unwavering commitment to her faith, did her best to stand by her husband, even as it became increasingly clear that his emotional instability would have disastrous consequences for both of them. Little did she know, looming in the near future was an event that would forever alter the course of their lives. The night of August 24, 1572, would be etched into the annals of French history as one of its darkest and bloodiest moments. The St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, ostensibly a politically motivated act to suppress the Protestant threat, quickly spiraled into an uncontrollable orgy of violence that claimed the lives of tens of thousands of men, women, and children. Tensions had been building for months. France was divided into two bitterly opposed camps. The Catholic majority, led by the powerful Guise family and supported by the mother queen Catherine de' Medici, and the Huguenot minority, who had begun to gain political influence. In an effort to bring peace to the fractured nation, Catherine had orchestrated the marriage of her daughter, Marguerite of Valois, also known as Margot of Valois, to the Protestant leader Henry of Navarre. The wedding, celebrated in Paris, brought together a large number of Huguenot nobles who came to support the union and the fragile peace it represented. But peace was not to last. Only days after the wedding, Admiral Gaspard de Coligny, a prominent Huguenot leader, was shot in an attempted assassination. The failed attack sparked outrage among the Huguenots, who demanded justice. What followed was a decision that would plunge the country into a bloodbath It is widely believed that Catherine de' Medici, fearing the growing influence of the Huguenots, convinced her son, King Charles IX, to authorize the elimination of their leaders. On the night of August 24, 1572, 
As Paris lay sleeping, bells rang out across the city, signaling the beginning of the massacre. What had initially been intended as a targeted strike against Huguenot leaders quickly degenerated into uncontrolled violence. Catholic mobs roamed the streets, indiscriminately slaughtering anyone they suspected of being Protestant. The massacre spread from Paris to the provinces, engulfing the entire country in bloodshed. Women and children were not spared. Entire families were dragged from their homes and brutally murdered in the streets. Bodies piled up in the Seine, and the blood of the slain ran through the cobbled alleys of Paris like rivers of crimson. Eyewitnesses recounted scenes of unimaginable horror. Pregnant women being disemboweled, infants being thrown from windows, and priests blessing the slaughter in the name of religious purity. The carnage lasted for days, with estimates of the dead ranging from 10,000 to as many as 30,000. Even though Queen Elizabeth was a devout Catholic and raised in a deeply religious family, the horror of the massacre left her shaken to her core. This was not the Christianity she had been taught to believe in, and the rivers of blood that ran through the streets of her new home filled her with dread. She had little political power to stop the massacre, and as the events unfolded, she found herself trapped in the royal palace, powerless to intervene. Even more terrifying was the transformation in her husband. King Charles IX, who had reluctantly given his approval for the killings, soon realized the full extent of the horror that had been unleashed. As the bodies piled up and reports of the widespread carnage reached him, Charles descended into a state of emotional and psychological collapse. He was haunted by the bloodshed and overcome with guilt, constantly muttering, What have I done? What have I done? He suffered violent outbursts, hallucinations, and fits of uncontrollable rage, convinced that the ghosts of the murdered Huguenots were coming to torment him. Elizabeth, who had already endured the strain of a difficult marriage, now found herself living with a husband who was slowly losing his mind. The once fragile peace between them shattered completely as Charles became increasingly erratic. He would pace the halls of the palace, wringing his hands, and scream at invisible figures, tormented by the blood on his hands. The young Elizabeth endured during his darkest moments with as much calmness and gentleness that she could muster. As his condition worsened, Charles suffered from severe hallucinations, often imagining blood pouring from his hands, a haunting reminder of the massacre he had sanctioned. Throughout these terrifying episodes, the queen remained at his side, offering comfort and support. Though her role in court was largely ceremonial and her political influence minimal, her presence as his wife during his final months was unwavering. For Elizabeth, the massacre was not only a national tragedy but a personal one. She had been married off as part of a political alliance, but now she was trapped in a palace filled with the stench of death and despair. Her husband's decline meant that she had no one to turn to for support. Charles had always been weak and unstable, but now he was a broken man and she was left to watch helplessly as he descended further into madness. Little did she know what fate had in store for her. The aftermath of the massacre sent shockwaves throughout Europe. France was plunged into further religious wars, with any hope of reconciliation between Catholics and Protestants shattered beyond repair. The massacre had not only destroyed lives but also obliterated the possibility of a peaceful resolution to the religious conflict that had gripped France for decades. For Elizabeth, the chaos outside the palace walls mirrored the turmoil within. Feeling alone and isolated, Elizabeth withdrew into herself, finding solace only in her Catholic faith and her young daughter Marie Elizabeth who had been born just two months prior to the massacre. But even her faith offered little comfort in the face of the overwhelming grief and despair that surrounded her. The palace, once a place of royal grandeur, had become a prison and Elizabeth was trapped in a nightmare from which there was no escape. The blood of the massacre had stained not only the streets of France but the very soul of the kingdom. Charles IX's physical and mental decline continued unabated. 
By the spring of 1574, it was clear that the young king's days were numbered. His body, ravaged by tuberculosis, grew weaker with each passing day, and his mind, already fragile, slipped further into madness. He spent his final months in agony, his guilt over the massacre never far from his thoughts. In his last days he was said to have hallucinated blood pouring from his own pores, a grim reminder of the thousands of lives lost under his reign. On May 30, 1574, at the age of 23, Charles IX died in his bed, leaving behind a kingdom in disarray and a young widow burdened by the weight of his legacy. For Elizabeth, the death of her husband was both a release and a profound sorrow. She had loved him as a good Catholic wife despite the distance between them and the madness that had consumed him. But his death also marked the end of her time as Queen of France. With no power or influence left in the court, Elizabeth was obliged to depart from France and return to her native Austria. Adding to the tragedy of the young queen's life, she was forced to leave her three-year-old daughter behind. The separation was deeply painful for Elizabeth, who had hoped to raise her daughter in the safety and familiarity of Austria. But according to the dictates of French royal lineage, Marie Elizabeth, although not an heir to the throne, was a daughter of France above all else, and as such, must remain behind. Elizabeth tearfully said a last goodbye to her infant child at the Chateau d'Ambois on August 28, 1575, never to see her again. The infant Marie Elizabeth was left under the care of her aunt, Marguerite of Valois of the royal court. Back in Vienna, Elizabeth had yet to endure more tragedy. On October 12, 1576, her beloved father Maximilian II died, and less than two years later her last great tragedy came. On April 2, 1578, her daughter, the young Marie Elizabeth, died at only five and a half years old. With so much tragedy and loss in her life, Elizabeth had no interest in pursuing further court life. When a new proposal of marriage was made to her from King Philip II of Spain after the death of his wife Anna in 1580, Elizabeth resoundingly refused, reportedly having replied to the offer with the famous phrase, The queens of France do not remarry. In early 1580, Elizabeth bought some lands near Stalberg and founded the convent of poor Claire's Mary, Queen of Angels, also known as the Queen's Monastery. Elizabeth henceforth devoted her life to following the example of her convent's holy patron in the exercise of piety, relief of the poor, and health care. Even impoverished daughters of the nobility found her support. Elizabeth also maintained a regular correspondence with her sister-in-law, Queen Margaret of Navarre, and when the latter was ostracized from the rest of the French royal family, Elizabeth made half of the revenues she received from France available to Margot. It has been said that Elizabeth wrote two books which she sent to Margot, a devotional work and a historical work, but both works are now lost to history. Elizabeth died on January 22, 1592, a victim of pleurisy, and was buried under a simple marble slab in the church of her convent. Next, meet the queen cursed in love, Margot of Valois.